attentive to the following announcements, also on Antioch's website. The church will no longer require you to register to attend Sunday morning worship service. However, all worshipers are required to sign a COVID-19 questionnaire form before entering the sanctuary. Doors will be closed at 10, 10 a.m. Anuvia will offer Strengthening Families programs for families who want to enrich the time they spend together. This free program begins August 2nd and includes learning opportunities for parents and children. Visit Antioch's website for more information and to register. Do you live, work, or worship in the Greer Heights community? Are you a man or woman age 18 or older and unemployed, underemployed, underpaid, or looking for a career change? Potions and Pixels, a nonprofit organization, has started a workforce development program in electrical construction. Teenage Dating Violence, Parent Training, what parents must know about teens, dating, and relationships will be offered in person on Thursday, July 14th at 6 p.m. or virtually on Friday, July 15th at 12 p.m. 
Attention Antioch members, there will be a special called Virtual Church Meeting on Tuesday, July 12th at 7 p.m. The meeting concerns a generous donation being offered to Antioch that will involve use of a portion of the church's property. Zoom link will be provided. God is blessing Antioch. Join Donna Kibambe to become more physically fit with your low-impact chair aerobics. Classes will be held every second and fourth Sundays after service and every Tuesday at 5.30 p.m. Activity open to everyone. Please help our senior ushers by donating cases of water for the UMBA Ushers Project by or before July 9th. Nancy Lyles will be at the church on July 9th at 8 a.m. Save the date, July 9th and 10th, to celebrate our esteemed and anointed Pastor Donnie R. Garris and Lady Regina Garris for serving Antioch Missionary Baptist Church by intentionally living a life worthy of God for 25 years. On July 9th, we will enjoy fish fry on the yard. Bring your tents, chairs, games, and cookout if you want to. On July 10th, our guest preacher will be Reverend Michael Flowers, pastor of Gethsemane Baptist Church of Lake Norman. To God be the glory. All Ministries Vacation Bible School begins this Wednesday and will be each Wednesday in July. The theme is Social Justice, Take Action for Jesus. Young adults and adults will study Missions in Motion, and H2K youth and kids will study the Gospel in Color. There will be classes, activities, and prizes for all ages. Come out and bring your children and neighbors to have fun, learning, and fellowshipping with each other. For more details, visit the announcements page on Antioch's website, www.antiochfamily.org, download our church app, check us out on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Good morning and welcome to the A, the Antioch Missionary Baptist Church. My name is Donnie Garris, the pastor here, and we welcome you to our worship experience wherever you are in our cyber congregation. We thank you for tuning in with us. What do I mean by us? There are people here in the house of the Lord here. Let yourselves be known by the clapping of your hands so they may know that we are here in joy and gladness. Glad to be in the house of the Lord one more time on this first Sunday of July, the Sunday before tomorrow, which is the 4th of July. On tomorrow, there are gonna be a lot of fireworks, on tomorrow, there's going to be a lot of family gatherings. On tomorrow, there's going to be just a lot of eating and celebrating on tomorrow. But this is the Lord's Day today. There ought to be some fireworks going on today. A lot of celebrating and gathering on today. For the Lord is good. The Lord is good. If it had not been for the Lord on our side, where would we be? thank God for you. And again, if you're worshiping with us in our virtual congregation, if you would just take a moment now and just put in the chat the city and state that you are from so that we may know where you are worshiping with us from and then give you a little shout out and thank you for worshiping with us wherever you are. And then if you are a first or second time guest of the A, in other words, this is your first or second time worshiping with us, we want to know who you are. Just put, your, put in the chat new, just put new, so that a member of our AE team, that is the Antioch Engagers, will contact you and just through the chat, while welcome you to our services. Again, we're just glad to be here. We have our mass choir with us, few in number, but those who are joining with us, prepare to lead us in song. Let's worship the Lord with the joy and gladness of just being alive and having an activity of our limb. Give him thanks and bless his holy name. For the Lord is good and worthy to be praised. Amen. Amen.
It's good to be here this morning. I'm going to bring to you this morning a scripture coming from Acts, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 12 in the NIV version. Okay, here we go. Oh, I forgot to tell you who I am. Good morning. <laughs> My name is Minister Willie Stevenson, and I'm one of the... Um, associate ministers here at Antioch. I hadn't shown my face in a good time, in a long time up here, but it's good to be here. So the word is for us and we just praise God for his word. And it's coming from Acts, the fourth chapter, verses one through 12. And it reads as follows. The priests and captains of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were gr greatly disturbed because of the apostles, because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus. In, and claiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put th them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of the men who believed grew and to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, of the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the new the law, excuse me, met in Jerusalem, and a Amos, the high priest, was there, and so were the uh, Caiaphas, John, 
Alexander. And oops. Sorry. Alexander and I got it out of order, excuse me. John and Alexander. Uh-huh. Okay. I guess that's the end of this scripture. I'm sorry, y'all. I didn't get a chance to look at it like it was. So this was our word for this morning. So we just, now let us pray. Father God. We come to you in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, Lord. Thanking you, Father God, for another opportunity to speak to you, to lift up your name, Lord. To come together this morning to hear your word, Father God. To hear the, the word coming from our pastor, Father God. And preparing our hearts, Father God, to open up to you and to receive what you have for us, Lord God. Lord, we thank you for the mighty power that you place in our lives sometimes when we are falling short, Father God. You pick us up, Father God, and give us a new journey, Lord God. You open up our hearts and help us to realize how much you love us, Father God. And we continue to seek your face, Father God. We continue to study your word. We continue to fellowship one with another. We continue, Father God, to receive the things that you are placing in our lives. Oh, yes, Lord, sometimes things fall short. Sometimes we don't feel well in our bodies and even in our spirits and our minds, Lord. But, Lord, when we call upon your name, Father, Father God, you bring us back to the place that you would have us to be, Lord. You build us up, Lord. You strengthen us, Lord. Because, Father God, I have had many a fall, Father God. But you pick me up. You turn me around, Father God. You place your spirit in my heart, Father God, and woke me up, Father, to do the things that you've called me to do. Yes, I fall short. If I don't say it, I do, I lie. But, Father God, the truth is real. Sometimes I get tired in my body, in my mind, in my spirit. But I remember how much you love us, Lord. No matter what state we in, if we fall, Father God, and we repent, Lord, you pick us up and start us over again, Lord. We just thank you and we praise you for this opportunity, Lord, to stand before you and lift up your name, Father God, and thank you for everyone that's present here today, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we thank you just for the anointing that you have placed upon our pastor, Father God. Continue to pour into him, Lord, as he continue to grow, Father God. And I know that sounds funny right now. All these years he's been in the ministry lord and i'm saying he's still growing of course he is because your spirit is growing in on the inside of him from day to day lord and we thank you for our pastor lord and every member here in antioch and all our visitors virtually and the ones that are present here today we love you lord we thank you and we praise you for another opportunity lord i was a little shaky before but lord when we stand before you you open us up and Lord let us know that you're with us no matter what it looks like, feels like, or whatever the case may be. We praise your name, Lord. We ask you to bless every individual in this place and the ones that are virtual, Lord. Not here, but they're here with us in looking and hearing and receiving your word. We thank you for all things that pertain to life and godliness, Lord. And we thank you for continuing to send us on and build us up that we may be the people that you would call us to be. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank you, Lord God. It's giving time. As we prepare to give, I want to remind us of the many promises that God makes in his word. And in this time, as it is associated with giving, we know the Malachi text, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. And the promise is, and the windows of heaven will be open unto you. New Testament picks up about giving, the promises of God. Give, and it shall be given unto you pressed down, shaking together, cup running over. And then there is the promise in the word that we love to call on, and God shall supply 
shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. Someone said that God gives promises to prove to us that he can be trusted and that he is trustworthy. So when we come to give, I want us to do like that little girl. Two little girls were playing and they decided to count the pennies to compare how much each had. One girl put her pennies down that she had collected and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten pennies she had. The other girl threw her coins down and she said one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. She showed five pennies, but counted five more on her hand. Her little girl, her friends just got in an argument with her. What were the you talking about? You got ten pennies. When I see you counted one, two, three, four, five, and then you went six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You don't have ten pennies. You have five pennies. And the little girl said, I have ten pennies. How do you know you have ten pennies when I only see five? She said, because my daddy told me that when he comes home, he promised me to give me five more pennies. She was counting on the promises of God. She was counting on the promises of her father. So when we give, we count on the promises of God, that he will open up the windows of heaven. We count on the promises of God that he will give us blessings shaken together, running over into our laps. We count on the promises of God. He shall supply all of our needs according to his riches. So when you give during these tough and difficult times, what you're doing is you're counting on God to show again and again and again he can be trusted and that he is trustworthy. As we prepare to give, we have several options that you can give in support of our ministry and the mission of our church. You can give online with Antioch's church app. If you have our church app on your phone, you can just tap into your church app and there find the giving option and there be instructed as to give. You can also go online at Antioch's website, www.antiochfamily.org. Just go to our website, find the giving option there in the header, and then you tap on that. It will also lead you how to give. Or we have where you can text to give. You can text to give right now, right where you are. It's a convenient way that you can just pull out your mobile phone, go to your text messaging feature on your cell phone, and just like you will send a text to your boo. You will put in the text message, y'all missed that. Y'all will put in the recipient message bar. Instead of boo, you will put 73256. You will put 73256. And instead of telling your boo how much you love your boo, you will put in the message bar AMBC232 dollar sign and how much you would give your boo. <laughs> You love your boo so much, you will put the dollar sign. But the text to give is a wonderful option. Again, just like you would send a text, you would put in the text, text recipient bar 73256. And just like you would send a message, you would put A and B, C, 232 dollar sign and the amount that you would give. Or you can mail to the church, 232 Skyland Avenue, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28205. Or oh, if you're here today, we have a way for you to place it in the basket uh, as you prepare to leave us for worship today. Whichever way you decide to give, we pray that you will give. Trust the promises of God, that God is trustworthy and can be trusted. Wherever you are and whatever form you have to give, whether it's using your phone, phone or your website or uh, the church app or an envelope. Will you raise it at this time? You raise it at this time. We are signifying that we are dedicating this way of our offering to God through prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for what we have to give and all that you have supplied for us to survive. We thank you, O oh Lord, for everything that you have provided us pertaining to life, health, and strength. 
the reason why we're living this very moment, the reason why we are making it this very moment is because of you. You are trustworthy. You can be trusted to fulfill every one of your promises. And so, Lord, with our offering lifted in the form of an envelope or a cell phone, Lord, we're saying how much we trust you. And we consecrate this offering to your work in the world through this church today. We love you, O oh God, and we thank you. And we count on you. We count on your promises. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Again, thank you so much for your gift of tithes and offerings to the church that we might continue our work. We normally just move on. I just want to make these couple of announcements available to you because it is an invitation to all persons, whether here or through our cyber congregation. I uh, want to remind you, we're starting our vacation Bible school. I know these announcements have already been made. You can go to our website. You can go to our Facebook page. You can go to our weekly reminders to get the details. But we do want you to know, vacation Bible school is starting this week. It started on Wednesday. It will occur only on Wednesdays this month. Only on Wednesday evenings of this month from 6 to 8 p.m. It will be held outdoors. It will be held outdoors. I believe the sun will be low enough and the heat will be a little cooler enough for us to enjoy the outdoors and to have our vacation Bible school on the outdoors. It will start this Wednesday from 6 to 8. We'll also have ministries on various Wednesdays who will come and uh, uh, exhibit their ministry uh, that you may know what they're all about and invite you to come and be a part of serving with them. So we want you to know it starts this Wednesday and every Wednesday for the remainder of this month from 6 to 8 p.m. when you come and uh, enjoy Vacation Bible School. Vacation Bible School is always a wonderful time for family and friends. It's for the whole entire family, young and old and all in between to come and just have some fun, learning, and uh, fellowshipping with one another. And then the other one will be given by Sister Laverne Johnson because on Sunday, I'm looking forward next Sunday to celebrating with you 25 years as pastor and people. 25 years, that's a long time that we have been together as pastor and people. And so Laverne just want to place some more emphasis on what's gonna take place on next weekend. And so we're looking forward to celebrating with you. Uh, people always ask me, what's going on on your 25th anniversary? I say, for 25 years, I've been telling whoever coordinates pastor appreciation, I do not plan my own birthday party. So whatever you all have planned, I'm looking forward to coming and enjoying with you, my wife and I, Minister Garris and I, celebrating with you 25 years of pastoral ministry. Laverne, will you come share what's gonna take place? Keep on clapping them hands, my beautiful people. Good morning, good morning. Will the Pastor Refreshers Committee Ministry stand up with me, please, as I do this announcement? Okay, y'all, here I go. Okay, I said about clapping your hands. Okay, you all, this coming Saturday, we'll be celebrating Pastor's 20 and Minister Gary's 25th anniversary. And can you clap your hands for one more thing, please? This is very important. Stand up, matter of fact, because God deserves all of this. Let's thank God for our pastor in his second year of being free from cancer in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Woo, praise your name, Lord. Okay, y'all, here I go. First of all, on this coming Saturday, from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., we will be having a fish fry and more right here on our own property. You will be able to set up your own tents, chairs, or whatever you need to make yourself comfortable outside. But remember, it's still COVID around. Please um, let's follow our guidelines and be safe while we, enjoy, we are enjoying ourselves. There will be a cash app available later on for you all to bless Pastor Nim if you want to on the cash app. Um, to bless Pastor Nim, okay, cash app, there will be instructions on next Saturday about the bathrooms. The bathrooms will be available and it'll be at two people at a time 
COVID is still around you all. There will be signs posted on telling you all of that. You will be asked to sign a waiver. We used to that because of COVID as you come in on the parking lot. The colors for next Saturday will be, and next Sunday be silver, pink, purple, and blues are all shades. Each minister can do their presentation on next um, Sunday. But remember, uh, um, the Pastor Refreshing Committee will be receiving Pastor them gift because of what? COVID. Thank you. And we need um, help from the following ministries. We need help from the parking lot ministry, ushers. We need music. Someone got a speaker or something we can use so we can have some nice music playing. Um, if you want to set up, you come and set up at 1030. And uh, in case it rains, y'all, let's pray in the name of Jesus. Because when you plan something outside, you never know what's going to happen. That um, we'll have it outside, but if not, we will have it Sunday evening after church, if it's God's will. Um, and we will be, you will be responsible for cleaning up your own area. So y'all, let's pray in the name of Jesus that we'll be able to have a good time outside at our fish fry and more to celebrate our beautiful black pastor and minister Gareth and Jonathan. Amen. Can I get a hand? Thank you. Again, we're looking forward to uh, celebrating what God is doing and has done with these 25 years, pastor and people together, working together to the glory of God for the good of so many other people. And we have grown through all these years together. So we're looking forward to it. It's preaching time. come down to the third part of my sermon series that I've been preaching, sermon series titled The Acts of the Holy Spirit. The Acts of the Holy Spirit. Again, I, I reference what really inspired me to talk on the Acts of the Holy Spirit is that when I was at Princeton Theological Seminary as a student, I had the fortunate opportunity to be a student of Dr. Clarice Martin a black woman scholar known for her studies and her works on Luke and Acts. In her Bible study guide on Acts, titled Tongues of Fire, Studies in the Acts of the Apostles, this is what sparked my thoughts for this sermon series. She said, it is the Acts of the Holy Spirit that empowers the growth and expansion of the Christian movement from a small band of women and men to a worldwide movement. So strong is Luke's emphasis on the activity of the Holy Spirit in the founding and growth of the church. That another name for the book of Acts could be the Acts of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, she says, is a very important theme in Acts. The Greek word for spirit, pneuma, occurs four times in Mark, five times in Matthew, 13 times in Luke, 41 times in Acts. Though this book of the Bible is often titled the Acts of the Apostles or simply Acts, we do see the Acts of the Holy Spirit is what is active empowering and encouraging and energizing and emboldening the actions of the apostles. So in this series, what I hope that we will see is that it is the acts of the Holy Spirit that provides the power. It's the acts of the Holy Spirit that provides the power that we see in the apostles preaching, the apostles healing, and the apostles teaching. I've already preached on the dynamic preaching power of the Holy Spirit. I've already preached on the delegated healing power of the Holy Spirit. Today I want to talk about the dynamic teaching power of the Holy Spirit. The choir will come with another selection and after which we'll come back and we'll preach on the dynamic teaching power of the Holy Spirit. 
from Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. Let's continue to bless the Lord.
most holy and all wise God. We woke up early this morning, pressed our way to church, and got ourselves ready at home to give you some praise, to bless your holy name, and to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Where would we be without your goodness and your mercy toward us? You are worthy of all the glory. You are worthy of all the honor. You are worthy of all the praise. Thank you, Lord for goodness, grace, and mercy. In Jesus' name, we give you praise. Bless us now when we come to the hearing of your word. Bless the preaching of it and the hearing of it, that we may be transformed, made anew, to do those things that will glorify you. We praise you and give you honor. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you're happy and you know it, put some hands together. And thank the Lord. Thank you so much. The scripture reading, Acts chapter 4. Verses 1 through 12 reads like this again in the New International Version. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, the elders, the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them, by what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this. You and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Again, there it is, nestled right there in verse 2. And they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Again, I want to talk on the subject, the dynamic teaching power of the Holy Spirit the dynamic teaching power of the Holy Spirit. Preaching and teaching are partners in ministry, but teaching and preaching are also different in ministry. It was the late Robert Charles, known as R.C. Sproul, who was an American theologian and Presbyterian pastor who made this difference between preaching and teaching. 
The late Robert Sproul put it this way. He said, preaching involves such things as exhortation, exposition, admonition, encouragement, and comfort, while teaching is the transfer of information and instruction in various areas of content. He said, in practice, however, there is much overlap between the two, preaching and teaching. Preaching must communicate content and include teaching. And teaching people the things of God cannot be done in a neutral manner, but must exhort them to heed and obey the word of God. God's people need both preaching and teaching. Another person said of the difference between preaching and teaching, this person said, teaching on the one hand is directed towards the mind so that we know something, and preaching on the other hand is directed towards the will so that we do something about it. Therefore, teaching is informational and preaching is transformational. Preaching is proclamation, teaching is education, both are required. And another said preaching and teaching are twin ministries with the symbiotic relationship, both announcing the good news of the gospel and both sharing what it means. When we see the acts of the Holy Spirit through the actions of the apostles, we notice that there were these twin ministries these partners in ministry. We see that there was both dynamic preaching and dynamic teaching. And when we come to the text, we find out that there was so much dynamic preaching and so much dynamic teaching to the point that Peter and John were arrested. They were in prison and persecuted for preaching and teaching. The text says the priests and the Sadducees were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching. They were educating. They were transform, transferring information and instruction to the people. And they were proclaiming. They were preaching. They were communicating good news and they were expositing and encouraging the people with the gospel in Jesus about the resurrection of the dead. And so they seized Peter and John for their teaching and their preaching. Both the twin ministries, preaching and teaching by Peter and John, were so dynamic that it upset the religious leaders who arrested and had them put in jail. But because of their dynamic preaching and because of their dynamic teaching, the number of men, not counting the women and children, according to the New International Version, the number grew because of teaching and preaching. It grew to about 5,000. Both were dynamic. Look at this text. It's a very interesting text. This, this all has to do with when Peter and John were confronted by a crippled beggar. A crippled beggar was sitting on the gates, near the gates called the, gates called the city of beauty, the city gates called the gates of beauty, the beautiful gates. And as people were entering in for their three times a day prayer meetings, in the morning, at noon, and in the afternoon, as this man was sitting there crippled, begging for money to be given to him. We saw that in chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, where Peter told the man, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus, walk. Peter said to the crippled beggar man, I don't have money, I don't have silver, I don't have gold, I don't have what you're expecting, but I do have something. I have something to inspire you. I have something to empower you. I have something to uplift you. I have something to help you. I have something to heal you. And I'm going to give you what I got. I have Jesus to give. In the name of 
Jesus walk? May I ask a question? I asked it before when I preached about the dynamic preaching power of the Holy Spirit, but I asked you a question. Have you got Jesus? Come on now. Have you got Jesus? Do you really have Jesus? Because if you got Jesus, then you got something to give. You got something to give. You have new life to give somebody. You have new hope to give. You have new joy, new strength, new power. Don't be ashamed. Don't be apologetic of the name of Jesus because you've got something to give. In the name of Jesus. The miracle story says that instead of giving the crippled man a handout, Peter gave him a hand up. Peter took the crippled man by his begging hand and helped him up, and instead of normally taking weeks to heal, the man's feet and ankles instantly became socketed. The man jumped to his feet, began walking about, jumping around like a little child, praising God aloud. The delegated healing power of the Holy Spirit acting through Peter gave the man both the ability to do something he had never done before. And it gave the man access into a place he was not allowed entrance to enjoy before. The people who recognize him as the same man who used to sit crippled begging of them for money every time they went to prayer meeting and every time they went through the, the gate called beautiful. When they remember, that was the man that used to sit there and ask me, got any change? Can you, can you hook a brother up? Right. Now was in the side of the church, dancing and praising God. And when they saw this was the same man who used to sit outside begging them for money, they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him because they weren't acquainted with what the marvelous and miraculous power of God can do. Can I ask another question? I asked it during that sermon I preached about the delegated healing power of God. Can I ask you, do you know what the power of God can do? Anybody know what the healing power of God can do? Anybody know what the saving power of God can do? Anybody know what the helping power of God can do? Anybody know what the delivering power of God can do? They were amazed. They were astonished because they weren't acquainted with the miraculous and marvelous power of God and what God can do. And the text says, while the people were amazed over both the ability and the access that this miracle provided the man, the religious leaders were irate. They were indignant. They were incensed. That's why we come to chapter 4, verse 1 says, while Peter and John were speaking to the people, because they didn't know what was going on. They were not familiar with what the power of God can do. And in the middle while, while Peter and John were trying to tell them that this miracle resulted in this crippled man's ability to walk had nothing to do with their own power, had nothing to do with their piety, that it wasn't them. So don't stare at us with any worshipful or deifying intention. The God of our ancestral stories. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has glorified his son Jesus. It was the delegated healing power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name that put this man to his feet. While they were trying to explain this to the people, the text says right in the middle of speaking this, the priests, the chief of the temple police, and some Sadducees came up, interrupted the testimony, and arrested Peter and John. Now notice carefully, Peter and John were arrested because their teaching and their preaching caused a disturbance. It was Andrew Purvis who said, the preaching, and I add, and teaching, of the early church upset people, stirred things up, got preachers 
and teachers in trouble because it was centered on Jesus. Andrew Purvey said there needs to be a return to a clear and brave proclamation and education of Jesus Christ. The arresting officers were the priests, the chief of the temple police, and the Sadducees. And what you need to understand is that during this time, there were two main religious groups. One group was the Pharisees. The Pharisees, described by most commentaries, they were the vigilant ones. They were the nationalistic ones. They were the nativistic one. They were the leaders who felt deeply the responsibility for preservation of the written and oral law, the tradition of the Hebrew people, and the Mosaic holiness purity codes, and the most minute detail of the regulations of their religion. They were the conservatives. I mean, they were the preservatives. They were the fundamentalists. I mean, they were the faithfuls of the law. It was William Willimon in his book, Why Jesus, who said that the Pharisees, the Pharisees were the good, the pious, the holy, biblically knowledgeable religious leaders. The Pharisees stands for all of us good, true believers who in our self-righteousness, our presumptive piety and smugness, our great good deeds infuriate Jesus by our division of the sinners and the saved. As it relates to the text, the Pharisees accepted the idea of resurrection. They awaited for the coming of the Messiah, but they awaited for a Messiah that was divine, defined by their own expectations. They were waiting for a Messiah who would be the warrior king, the Messiah who would come in the manner of David, the one who would come, who would bring them back and put them back on top of the world again. But this wasn't the way Jesus had defined himself. That was the Pharisees. The other group was the Sadducees. The Sadducees, of the two Pharisees, the Sadducees welded the most power because they were those who controlled the wealth. They owned most of the land and they held close control of the money streams. They were the billionaires, if you will, the millionaires, if you will. They were the large campaign fantasiers. They were the corporate backers of the conservative political action group. Loyal Lloyd John Ogilvie in his book, Drawn Beat of Love said, collaboration with foreign conquerors was a necessary evil for the maintenance of their material position. They wanted no disturbance of the balance of power, the relationship they had carefully worked out with the Roman government. And as it relates to our text, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees believe in the resurrection and they waited for the expectation of a Davidic kind of Messiah, but the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in any existence or extension of life beyond the grave. They did not anxiously await or anticipate the coming of the Messiah for extremely specific political reason. The threat of it would bring a downfall to their financial security. Resurrection to them was synonymous with revolution to them. It would mean disturbance for them who desperately wanted to keep things as they were. So the ones who were particularly incensed and irate and indignant over what Peter and John taught and preached were the Sadducees. That's why verse 2 in the message version of the Bible put it this way, they were indignant that these upstart apostles were instructing the people, teaching the people, proclaiming to the people that the resurrection from the dead had taken place in Jesus. It was the Sadducees who really instigated the arrest of Peter and John. They were the ones who had a particular issue with Peter and John because they taught and preached the resurrection. 
They taught and proclaimed a dead but resurrected and living Jesus. They had a problem. They were disturbed. The Sadducees were very disturbed with Peter and John. They were upset. They were stirred up about the content of what Peter and John taught, how they educated people, how they preached to people, how they proclaimed the good news of the gospel that Jesus had been resurrected from the dead. Plus, the Sadducees, along with the Pharisees and other religious leaders, were the ones who concocted the whole thing that led to the crucifixion of Jesus. And now you say the one we had killed is alive? He can't have you going around here talking like that. And to hear that Peter and John were going around preaching and teaching this same Jesus whom they had crucified was resurrected and alive. And on top of that, large numbers of people were believing Peter and John's teaching and preaching. They were believing that Jesus had been resurrected from the dead. And on hearing Peter and John's teaching and preaching, thousands of people were giving their allegiance to this resurrected Jesus. And thousands of people were choosing to join Peter and John's church of the resurrection. And to hear that because of Peter and John's teaching and preaching, the number of membership had increased to 5,000. And according to Acts chapter 2, verse 42, these thousands of people were now devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. <laughs> they were going to Bible study. They were going to worship. They were being educated and proclaimed to through the teaching and the preaching of the apostles. Peter and John's teaching and preaching upset the religious leaders. R.C. Sproul, whom I mentioned earlier, said this. He said, God's people need both preaching and teaching. God's people need more than a few minutes of preaching a week. They should feed on the word of God several times each week. They should take advantage of what is available to them by way of instruction in the deep truths of scripture. I want to emphasize you all that we need both. We need preaching on Sundays and for us we need preaching on we need teaching on Wednesday. We need both. You don't get it all just on Sunday morning. We need both preaching and teaching. Whenever day and time of the week both are available, we should be availing ourselves to both preaching and teaching. Because if we want biblical education, if we want spiritual transformation, we need to take advantage of what is available by way of preaching and teaching the deep truths of the word of God. And since I've already talked earlier in this series about the dynamic preaching power of the Holy Spirit, let me focus on the other twin, the spirit dynamic teaching power of the Holy Spirit. You may remember some years and years and years ago, we studied together as a church a book titled Spiritual Disciplines Within the Church, written by Donald S. Whitney. In the book, he had a chapel, chapter called Why Learn in the Church? Why Learn in the Church? And two of the reasons Donald Whitney gives for learning in the church and why we ought to learn in the church and why we ought to be instructed and taught in the church, why we ought to take advantage of what is available by way of teaching of scriptures in the church, why should we learn in the church? He said, number one, because the church... It's what he called the pillar and ground of the truth of God. He got that from 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. And he went on to say, the church is like a pillar that supports something above it. That which the church supports or lifts up is the truth of God. God created the church and gave the church the responsibility to elevate his word. 
So anyone who is not learning in the church distances him or herself from the only pillar in the world which upholds the truth of God. The world ain't going to uphold the truth of God. It's in a faithful Bible teaching church that you will be taught the truth. It's in the church you are taught the truth about yourself. It's in the church you're taught the truth about God. It's in the church you're taught about the truth about your need to know God through Jesus Christ. It's in the church you're taught about the truth, living most wisely and how to live it abundantly. It's in the church. You learn the truth about judgment and eternity. Do you know what the gospel is? Do you know the biblical evidences of salvation? Do you even know how to pray? Do you know what your spiritual gift is? Do you know the attributes of God? Do you know the great doctrines of salvation? How much do you know about justification? How much do you know about regeneration? How much do you know about sanctification? How much do you know about glorification? No one knows these things naturally and the world ain't going to tell you. The world doesn't even use any of these words because these are God's words. They have to do with life and eternal life and the fact that only the church talks about them underscores the reason you need to learn in the church and second of all he said the reason why we are to learn in the church is because learning in the church helps protect you from error he quoted acts chapter 18 verse 24 and 25 26 he says if we do not learn with the church we are likely to drift into erroneous individualistic interpretation of Scripture. He said in Acts chapter 18, Apollos had become mighty in the Scriptures, and yet despite his brilliance, despite his education, despite his preaching experience, despite his spiritual fervency, despite his personal effort to grasp the truth, he still held an inaccurate understanding of some key matters related to the way of God. Dr. William Watley called it, he had some gaps in his understanding of the way of God. And only when he was willing to learn from a couple in the church did he escape the error that he was inadvertently promoting. If someone as gifted and zealous as Apollos could misunderstand important doctrines without the teaching ministry of the church, so can we. Oh, y'all, we need to be in the church learning. We need to be in the church learning, not only hearing the word preached on Sunday, but learning when it's made available to us during the week. When we have opportunity, we need to be taught the word of God. In light of today's world conditions, crisis, and circumstances, we ever so need to learn, be instructed and taught in the church to protect us from a lot of errors that we hear in the day. We will learn if we come to church and learn. If we, we will learn in light of all the mass shootings and gun violence. We will learn from church teachers like Dr. Lisa Thompson, the ordained Baptist minister and Union Theological Seminary Harvard Letters professor who said we can't say that guns and gun violence exist in the Bible, but we can think about parallels between how we interpret violent texts, how we interpret God's disposition towards violence, and the, how God feels about the sanctity of life and human dignity, how, what God says about our relationship to our neighbor and others, and how God connects our relationship with himself. Those things we can talk about and make parallels to what we do. Because if the Bible and our faith values life, the sanctity of life, the imago dei in every individual. If we say that gun violence leads to disregard for human life and dignity and does not recognize the image of God in every person because it takes away life so carelessly, then we can begin talking about gun violence as people of faith and people of the word. But you got to come to church. You got to come to church to understand what we mean by Imago Dei. 
That's a, that's a God word. That means every one of us are stamped with the image of God and every one of us have significance, value, and importance. Every life should be valued. You ain't going to get that in the world. You get that in the church. In light of the Supreme Court overturn of Roe versus Wade, we'll learn from church teachers like Reverend Tracy Blackman, ordained female minister of the United Church of Christ and also associate general minister of justice and local church ministries. When she was asked, how do you see abortion rights consistent with Christian teaching? She said, in my sacred text, the word, in my biblical understanding, when God created humankind, it was the only creation that God gave choice. Choice is inherent in my faith. The right to choose is part of our God-given inalienable rights. As a Christian, the creation story in Genesis says it's the right of every human being to have choice, that God gave us choice. Human beings should have the right to make these decisions for themselves, and women should not have to jeopardize their lives because they make such a decision. We don't have to agree about how you feel about abortion. For me, this is about the rights of humans to decide how they want to live and show up in this world. It's my body. God gave it to me. It's not up for vote. It's not up for consensus. It's not up for other people to act upon it. I'm responsible for my own body. And if you believe what I'm doing is wrong, you get to believe that. But you don't get to place your beliefs on my life, on my body. No, Jesus didn't say anything about abortion. But Jesus had a lot to say about love. And Jesus also never had anything to say about making people do what I want them to do. Neither did God. God said, this is morally right and this is morally wrong. You choose, and if you choose wrong, I'm still going to love you. In light of the Supreme Court, who sided with the high school football coach who forced his players to pray with him on the 50-yard line after games, he, laid, he gave his players no choice. He said his Christian faith compelled him to do it. Then we'll learn from church teachers like Mark Winfield, executive director and publisher of Baptist, Baptist News Global, who said, where did that coach learn that Christian faith compelled him to make them boys do that? There is no biblical mandate for such an attitude. In fact, quite the opposite. Jesus scorned the Pharisees who made a show of their public piety and said instead it would be better to pray alone in a closet. The coach demanded a public display of prayer allegedly to give glory to God, but what everyone else saw was him giving glory to his own ego and not to God. It's just another case of Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism begins with the premise that America was founded as a Christian nation, which it was not. How can it be a Christian nation? You had slaves. How can it be a Christian nation when you, when you try to exterminate the Native American? That's not a Christian nation. So it must follow that Christians must be given special privilege. The First Amendment religious liberty is all right as long as it's liberty for me and not for thee. He said modern Christians must understand that we live in an increasingly pluralistic society and that assuming Christian privilege actually does more harm than good. If you want to be a good witness for Jesus, this is not the way to do it. It's tone deaf, arrogant, rude, pretty much the opposite of every virtue of love described in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Listen, y'all, if there ever was a time we need both preaching and teaching to be exhorted and instructed, it's now. We need to be feeding on the Word of God more than a Sunday a week. We need to be delving deep into the truths of God, upholding it and not drifting from it. When we learn from the teaching of the Lord and we learn from the teaching of the Word, we learn Jesus' value system. We learn about Jesus' plan. We learn about Jesus' purpose in the world. We learn about Jesus' will, Jesus' way, Jesus' life, Jesus' truth. When we come and learn from the church, we learn about Jesus' words on, about forgiveness, Jesus' instructions on holy living, Jesus' example of showing mercy, Jesus' definition of true righteousness. Jesus shows us how to treat in and all kinds of folks justly. Jesus shows us how 
how to be peacemakers and not peace breakers. Jesus teaches us about how to pray. Jesus tells us about the creation of every human being. Jesus shows us how to love everybody in 1 Corinthians. You learn that in the Bible, in the church. Andrew Purvey said teaching in the church involves learning a counterscript to the script society and culture teaches and learning it deeply and transformationally. We do this in order that our perspective and values and actions are expressions of Jesus' truth rather than the expressions of the wisdom of the society and culture we live in. And this is what he said that just ought to smack every last one of us. If Jesus is not shaping our living, then something else is. If Jesus, if you ain't learning about Jesus, if you're not seeking to live his will, his way, his way, something else is shaping your life. What Peter and John were teaching and preaching was transforming the souls. It was educating the minds. It was shaping the lives of 5,000 folks. And the Sadducees felt they had to put a stop to both of these twin ministries of the disciples. It was evening when the Sadducees and them had Peter and John arrested because Jewish law forbade a trial after sundown. So Peter and John were thrown into jail and held until the next morning. And the next morning, verse 7 says, the next day a meeting was called in Jerusalem. And we're told the names and positions of the group of religious leaders who came together, who made up what was then called the Sanhedrin court. One writer said everybody who was anybody in the religious leadership was there. As they sat in, in their customary semicircle, they had Peter and John brought in front and center to be questioned. The council of critics and complainers began their interrogation by simply asking Peter and John, by what power or what name did you do this healing of the cripple? Peter and John were challenged to tell who delegated them the power, who deputized them with the authority to heal the formerly crippled begging man. And the message version of verse 8 says, with that Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. It ain't nothing like having a Holy Ghost filled teacher. It ain't like having a Holy Ghost filled preacher. With that Peter filled with the Holy Spirit, let loose. Not to confuse us when Acts chapter 2, back in Acts chapter 2 verse 4, it says that all those who were in the upper room, you know it was about 120 of them, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. What you need to know is the understanding there in Acts chapter 2 verse 4 is after the initial descent of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Peter and the rest of the 119 of them were completely filled of all the power they would ever need. Let me put it this way. Dr. H.P. Charles put it this way in a sermon title. What is this? He said, every born again Christian has all of the Holy Spirit he or she will ever get. Did you hear me? Every born again Christian has all of the Holy Spirit that he or she will ever get. But the problem is the Holy Spirit is trying to get all of you. Y'all missed that. <laughs> you have all of the Holy Spirit that you will ever get. The issue is the Holy Spirit is working on trying to get all of you. He's trying to get your mind. He's trying to get your heart. He's trying to get your spirit. He's trying to get your attitude. He's trying to get your actions. He's trying to get your, your attitude. He's trying to get your behavior. He's trying to get your conduct. He's trying to get all of you. There's a different understanding of the word field here in this text. Here, Feel indicates a special temporary act of the Spirit performed upon Peter. Here is the understanding of Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, meaning he had a special feeling. 
It has to do with a special feeling for a special need, for a special moment, and a special opportunity of ministry and witness. It's what is called an occasional anointing for special purposes, special assignments, special challenges, special tasks. Let me put it this way. Our home, all of our homes are connected to a main water system. All of us. All of us are connected to a water main. This supplies all of our homes with an adequate water for everyday use. Just go to the spigot, turn it on, you got water. Everybody connected to the same water main. But suppose a fire breaks out at your house. The firemen, what they do, they connect to a hydrant. Y'all not catching this. They connect to a nearby hydrant to secure a special flow. A special flow for your house. When they turn on the hydrant for this special flow, everybody ain't getting overflowed until they tap in this special hydrant for a special flow to take care of your emergency situation. So to be full of the Spirit is like our homes supply continuously with adequate water. You got it already in you, y'all. You got it already in you. You got it already in you, y'all. You got it in you. But to be filled is to tap into a greater flow to be given extra energy, extra power for extra serving. Has anybody ever had to, if, has anybody ever had a special occasion, a special task, a special emergency, a special challenge, a special need, and you pray, I know I got the Holy Spirit in me, but I need a special anointing for this special emergency, this special task, this special challenge. I need to say, Spirit, fill me. I need an extra flow. I need an extra anointing. I need an extra feeling of your spirit. I need extra power. Extra energy. This is the understanding of Peter being filled with the Spirit in this test. It has to do with a feeling, a tap into an extra flow of special strength and special power, special enablement, special equipment for a special situation. And when Peter was filled, especially anointed, with this extra power of the Holy Spirit, Lord Ogilvy said the Spirit took possession of Peter's mind, saturated his emotion, compelled his will, pulsated in his body. He had an immediate awareness of the presence of God, an unconquerable sense of power, and an irresistible control over his will and his inner spirit. To the Sanhedrin court, he said to the question, by what power and what name did you do this? It said that Peter, filled by the Holy Spirit, with this extra anointing, began speaking about God healing the man in, as, and through Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Peter insisted that Jesus, whose name had healed the cripple, was the same Jesus who had been raised from the dead. And the man was healed by God through faith in the presence, person, and power of Jesus. The truth is, by the name of Jesus, this man stands before you heal. And then watch this y'all. Peter went on to do another teaching session. He then began to teach on Psalm 118 verse 22 declaring that, 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 declaring that Jesus was the fulfillment of the prophecy spoken in Psalm 118 verse 22 that Jesus was treated as the rejected stone. That Jesus was crucified but God exalted him to be the cornerstone. That God exalted him to be the chief stone, that God exalted him to be the foundation stone, that God exalted him to be the keystone at the top of a corner which binds the walls together where they meet. So God has made Jesus the one of whom we build our faith. God has made Jesus the one who holds all things together. God has made Jesus the one who we determine whether or not we are tilted or 
whether we're standing tall on Christ, God has made him the solid rock. And then Peter, then Peter switched from teaching to preaching because they're both the same, y'all. <laughs> With a little difference, but they act as twin ministries. He then began to preach what he believed to be this truth about the uniqueness of Christ. He said, throughout this whole world, no other name, no other name, no other name has been given among human beings through which we must be saved. He began to proclaim Jesus saves to the utmost. Jesus saves. The understanding is not that Jesus saves, but that only Jesus. He alone is the means of salvation. All other means are excluded. One Bible version says there is no salvation by anybody else, not even a second name under heaven appointed for us and our salvation. The living Bible says there is salvation in no one else under all heaven. There is no other name for which we call on to be saved. Jesus saved. Jesus saved. That woman, that woman jumped from a burning building. This woman was in a burning building and she jumped many floors down into the net held by sturdy firemen. She was later interviewed and she was asked, how could you do that? How could you just jump from a burning building many floors high into the safety net of the firemen? How could you do that? Where did you get the courage? And the woman just simply answered, I had to do it because it was my only chance to live. <laughs> Ever since what Peter said, the Christian faith has taught and preached this gospel that Jesus is our only chance to be saved. Jesus is our only chance to live. Jesus is our only chance to get it right. Jesus is our only chance to make it. Jesus is our only hope. Jesus is our only chance. Jesus. Is our only chance. He's the hope for the world. Salvation for humankind. I ended with this. It was Dr. Benjamin E. Mays in his sermon, Light for the World's Agony. Benjamin E. Mays, that Baptist minister, Benjamin E. Mays, that civil rights leader, Benjamin E. Mays, that mentor of Dr. Martin Luther King G. Jr., Benjamin E. Mays, that once president of the HBCU Morehouse College, Benjamin E. Mays. Benjamin E. Mays, who was born in 96 South Carolina. Benjamin E. Mays, who died in Atlanta in 1984. Benjamin E. Mays wrote a sermon titled Light for the World's Agony. And he said, you know what, y'all? Our, our evangelistic efforts are aimed to convert the little sinner and not the big sinner. We go out to convert the little drunkard. We go out and convert the little gambler. We go out and convert the little liar. We go out and convert the little thief. We go out and com convert the man who lives in the slums. And we go out and convert the one who lives in the alleys. The problem is we seldom try to convert the big gambler. We seldom try to convert the big thief who reside in high places. <laughs> if our civilization is to be saved, we must convert men and women in high places, <laughs> positions of government, positions of business, positions of education, positions of the church and state. We all, great and small, he said, need to be redeemed. But in every land, the people at the top who hold the destiny of the world in their hands, who need most to be redeemed. Because if we cannot convert the ones at the top, the rulers of this world, may God have mercy on our souls. Oh, y'all, we got to go run tell, preach and teach to the little sinner 
and run, go tell, teach and preach the big center. Regardless if they hold position of government, regardless if they hold position of business, regardless if they hold position of education, regardless if they hold position of the church, regardless if they hold position of the state, they need to know who Jesus is, what Jesus has, and what Jesus is all about. We can tell them that Jesus can save them too. Teach and preach those in city council. Teach and preach to those who are county commissioners. Teach and preach those who are on the board of education. Preach and teach the mayors of our cities. Teach and preach the governors of our state. Teach and preach to the city planners of our states. Teach and preach the state's representatives. Teach and preach the judges of criminal justice. Teach and preach both Republican, Democrat members of Senate and the House. Teach and preach the conservative and liberal Supreme Court justices. Teach and preach the President of the United States. Teach and preach all of his cabinet members. Teach and preach the pastors and priests and preachers of churches. Teach and preach any of all who have tags and titles, who sit high and look low. Teach and preach. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. There is salvation in no one else under all heaven. No other name by which we can call little sinner, big sinner. No matter where you are, call on the name of Jesus. Won't he save you? Won't he pick you up? Won't he heal you? Won't he deliver you? Say yeah. 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 Go preach my gospel, says the Lord. Go teach my word, says the Lord to everybody that would hear. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. How to reach the masses. Men, women, boys, girls of every birth. For the answer, Jesus gave the key. If I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men, women, boys, and girls unto me. Oh, the world is hungry for the living bread. Lift the Savior up. Lift the Savior up. Lift the Savior up for them to see. Trust him and do not doubt the words that he said. I'll draw, draw all men, all women, boys and girls unto me. Teach them up, preach them up. Still he speaks from eternity. If I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw, I'll draw all unto me. Won't he do it? Say yeah. Stand on your feet. How to reach the masses, men of every bird. For the answer, Jesus gave the key. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw. Oh, the world is hungry for the living bread. And do not doubt the word. I draw. Lift them up, lift them up. Lift them up. Teach them up, teach them up, preach them up, preach them up. Still his speech return. And I, the earth, I'll draw. Well, 
most holy wise God, we thank you for your word today, reminding us how important teaching, the teaching power of the Holy Spirit, as well as the preaching, the preaching power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us how important it is to learn the teachings and to hear the preaching of the church. We pray now, O oh Lord, that we'll return to being devoted, to be committed. Lord, this pandemic got us off, off course. It got us off track. It got us away from some stuff. And if not careful, oh Lord, some of us have drifted away because we've been untouched and not in touch with the teachings and the preaching of the word. We pray now, oh Lord, you bring us back. We understand, oh God, that's where we hear about the truth. That's where the church is responsible for upholding the truth in this day and time. We pray, oh God, that you would bring us back to enjoy preaching and enjoy teaching. Lord, creating us a thirst again. Lord, creating us a thirst. Let us be hungry again for the word. For the word, oh God, for the word. For the word that we might learn how to live for thee, live to your glory, do all the things you called us to do good for others and to continue to grow spiritually that you may transform us. Lord, we pray for the sick and shut in. There are many on our list. It seems to grow day by day, whether sick or bereaved. Lord, somebody's asking us to remember them in prayer even as we think about it that might not even made our list. Lord, we know we all stand in need of prayer. So Lord, I pray, I pray you give the one who is weak strength. Lord, we pray. We pray for the one who is confused, give them wisdom. We pray. We pray for the one who is scared that you give them courage. We pray. We pray for one who's at a road of decision, don't know what is right from wrong, good from bad, real from fake, true from false. We pray that you give them discernment. Pray, we pray right now, oh God, that you give them what they need. Give them what they need, oh God. Be the one that they can find their trust and to see again that you are trustworthy because your promises are true. Lord, we thank you for your word. We bless your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Perhaps there's someone here or who has heard us or listened to us in our virtual audience. The Spirit moves wherever the Spirit wants to move, however, whomever the Spirit wants to move. So whether here or there, perhaps the Spirit has moved across your heart and said, you know, you need to give Jesus an all-out try. Give him an all-out try. See and prove his promises are true. Give Jesus an all-out try. Maybe, maybe the Spirit has moved to you and said you didn't give the Lord an all-out try. You, you quit on him too, too soon. You gave up too soon. Why don't you come back? Come back. Give your life committed to Christ again. Perhaps you're looking for a church home. Yeah, like I said, this, this pandemic put a lot of distance, not only socially, but spiritually, some of us got disconnected from the church. We got disconnected from the things of the church, and it was cool for a while, but now we out there. We, we, we lost. We got to find our way back. The Lord welcomes us back to his church. He says, come on back. Come on back. You need what the church has to offer to get you in the world today. Is there one? If you are someone, if you are in our virtual orders, would like to give your life to Christ or become a member of the Antioch Baptist Church family, just go to our Antioch website, www.antiochfamily.org, submit a discipleship form that is there on the website. Or you may send us an email by clicking the send email button on Antioch's Facebook page. You will find a discipleship form there also, and you can submit it and we will be in response quickly to you and rejoice with your decision. If you're somebody here in the sanctuary 
We give you an opportunity to. All you have to do is raise your hand right where you are, and the ushers will come to you with the same form and just fill it out, and someone will be in touch with you to give you further instructions as to what to do. We do hope that you make that decision. It's a time for to return to the church. It's a time to return to the church. As everything else is relaxing and allowing people to come back, don't forget to come back to the church. Don't get to come back to your first love where you found the love of Jesus Christ. Come on back. This is the first Sunday we want to also prepare ourselves for communion. The church, you ain't going to get this in the world. You're not going to get this fellowship in the world where we come together as the church. The church to identify in our witness as together as a church. What Jesus Christ did for us to save us and to save the world. We invite you to prepare yourselves at home. If you have not already, quickly, quickly do so. Get some elements together. Whether there's something that symbolizes the bread, something that symbolizes the juice of the cup, and we'll partake together. Those of us who are in the sanctuary, we hope that you have your elements. We hope that you have your elements. If not, raise your hand and the ushers will come to you and bring to you the elements of the communion. We come together in memory to remember what all Jesus means to us. He's the soul, he's the salvation of our soul. He's our hope for tomorrow. He's everything that we need. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for what we're about to receive. We pray, O oh Lord, that it will rekindle our love as well as our memory of Jesus' love for us. Gave his life on the cross for loving us and for us to love him back. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will continue to spread love not only in us but through us to the world. As we prepare now to receive this bread and this cup, we do so in remembrance of you, and we thank you for no greater love than this that you laid down your life for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Prepare ourselves with the bread. Pray that those at home are prepared to partake with us. The bread symbolizes the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was beaten with many stripes, but he endured it all, all the suffering, for he knew at the end of it would be our salvation. Take ye, eat ye, all of it. Jesus passed the cup, said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me, and remember this cup that has the grape juice that looks like my blood that will be shed on the cross for you for the remission of your sins, that you will take this and remember it's my blood that washed you from all of your sins. Take ye drink, you all of it. As often as we eat and drink of this cup, we actually preach a sermon together. We preach our faith in the sacrifice, the crucifixion, the death and burial and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We thank all of you who've joined us virtually. We pray that you will join us on this weekend. We look forward to celebrating with you on Saturday and Sunday. Saturday here in the parking lot. Also Wednesday for Vacation Bible School. Come and enjoy and just return to church. Continue to learn and grow as God would have us to be. Until then, those of our virtual audience, may God continue to bless you and keep you. And again, we thank you for tuning in with us. And we pray that you have been blessed. God bless you, those of you in our virtual audience. God bless you. We hope to see you again. God bless you. Amen. Those of you who are here.